Hi, fellow believers in Christ. Today, I wanted to give you some um, tips on how to evangelize to, to a stubborn world. And the reason this world is stubborn is because of pride. In the Bible, God called the Israelites stiff-necked, uh, which is basically being stubborn. Um, people don't want to admit that they're wrong. And when you tell them about Jesus, in order for them to accept Jesus, they have to admit that they've been wrong their whole life. And it, you, ha you have to really step down from your high horse in order, in order to do that. And that's why people are so resistant to the gospel. Um, they also have to give up sin, and they don't want to do that either. So people can be very resistant. But it isn't our job to force people to believe in Jesus. And when you look at the Gospels, Jesus and the, the apostles never tried to force anyone to believe. They, they told the truth. They were very persuasive. But when people walked away, they were allowed to walk away. And people were allowed to have disbelief. So you and I don't force people to believe us, but we are evangelists who simply tell the truth. And um, um, But anyway, evangelizing is not um, terrorizing, <laughs> but it is being honest. And it does make people angry sometimes and even hostile. Um, but, uh, but you don't have to be a hostile person to get a hostile reaction. Some people think that they have to be hostile in order to evangelize, and God doesn't work that way. Um, now, God does rebuke people. Sometimes you do need to rebuke people, but, um, but anyway, you don't need to scream, <laughs> Um, on a bus where people can't get away from you and basically they're a captive audience and they're not they don't have any choice Jesus didn't do that to people he did go into the marketplace but people could always leave the marketplace um, or they could leave the area that he was standing in people were never held captive against their will so anyway um, but there but here's some tips that I've learned from experience about how to make it easier on yourself to evangelize. Top one is holiness. Um, if you have some sin in your life that you're practicing, it's going to make it a lot harder to share the gospel. Um, if, if there's anything that you're doing that you know is sinful, it, it takes your, your boldness away. Um, and this verse, Proverbs 28, 1 says, The righteous are as bold as a lion. Um, and there is, there is a correlation between your boldness and how righteous you're living. Um, so definitely forsake the world. Um, you know, give up every sin in your life. Repent. Um, forgive people. Um, humble yourself. Um, and then, then you will have the boldness to speak out. I've seen in my own life. If there's something that I'm addicted to or whatever, um, that's a, that's, or something in the world that I love, um, and I'm emotionally attached to something in the world, um, it's a lot harder for me to share the gospel with people. Or if I'm more self-absorbed, I can't really share the gospel very well. But when I'm really walking in holiness and faith, then it's super easy to share the gospel. So we also need the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, now, this doesn't mean that you have to feel goosebumps and tingly and, you know, there has to be a mist in the air and all this kind of stuff in order to have the power of God. Some people think the power of God is always physically manifested in some sort of sensation, and that's flat out not true. Some of the times in my life where the most biggest miracles have ever occurred, I didn't feel a thing. I really did not feel a thing. So I know it isn't true that you have to have goosebumps in order, you know, when the Holy Spirit's there, you're always going to have goosebumps. It's just not true. Um, but you do need to have faith. When you have faith, the, the Lord will put words in your mouth and he'll make you say what he wants you to say. 
So we do need the power of God. We need his words in our mouth and not something that we've made up. And I love this one. Make yourself of no reputation. The Lord taught me this personally. Um, you know, he taught me that, yes, when you're sharing the gospel, you're going to get rejected. People are going to look at you like you're a weirdo. They may even call you a weirdo. Um, people are people are going to want to walk away from you, and they will walk away from you. Um, sometimes people might insult you and falsely accuse you. Um, and so you're not going to have a good reputation. You're, you're not. Um, but Jesus himself, look in Philippians 2, 7, Jesus made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. So a bondservant is somebody who's of lower class than the one that they're serving. So when we share the gospel, we become of lower class than the person we're witnessing to. Um, and that's why that person has the power to reject us and reject our message. And also remember, it's actually Jesus they're rejecting. It's not us. Um, but but make yourself, let yourself be of no reputation. There's great freedom in that. If you don't want people to love you, if you don't, if you don't need people to love you, if that isn't your goal, you'll have so much more boldness. But if, if your goal is that people like you and look up to you and admire you, that'll take a lot of your boldness away. You won't be able to share the gospel because you know that when you share the gospel, people aren't going to admire you anymore. And that includes people in the church. Um, I've been um, kind of ridiculed and um, a little bit ostracized just as much by people in the church as by people who are not in the church when I'm sharing my testimony in the gospel. Um, I almost always get critical reactions from people when I, from church people, when I share my testimony because I talk about repentance and that that really makes a lot of church people angry. I've gotten lots of negative reactions. Um, so, but it, but if you want to have a good reputation, it's going to be really hard to share the gospel. And then know who you are. Um, in Acts twenty seven twenty three, it is God to whom I belong and whom I serve. If you know that you belong to God then you don't have the need to be affirmed and accepted by men. You don't have to belong to men of this world. So be prepared. You're going to get rejected. Know who you are. You are a child of God. Um, and you are a bondservant. So um, it's okay to get rejected. It's not, a, it's not the end of the world. Don't be ashamed. Don't go crawl in a hole. Um, it's okay. Just be prepared ahead of time that that's going to happen. Um, speak with purpose and authority. Jesus, remember, they marveled that both when he was 12 in the temple and later on when he was preaching in the temple, they marveled at the fact that he spoke with purpose and authority. And it's Jesus Christ who is alive inside of us and speaking through us when we share the gospel. So every time we share the gospel, we should be speaking with purpose and authority because it's Jesus Christ himself speaking through us. So don't try to be somebody's friend. This, this is a teaching that kind of came out in the 80s that we have to love on people and be their friends. And you have to spend, you know, nine months trying to make friends with your neighbor. And then maybe after nine months time, you'll be able to toe around the subject of Jesus, that's pure hogwash. That's not biblical. That's not how Jesus or the apostles shared the gospel with people. They got straight to the point. They didn't waste people's time. They didn't waste God's time, and they didn't waste their own time. They didn't tiptoe around the rose bushes, you know, bringing somebody tea and cupcakes for nine months and, you know, trying to get on that person's good side. Don't be fake, okay? The reality is, if you're a Christian, you're not a friend of the world. So the people that you're uh, witnessing to 
most of them aren't your friends and they're not going to be your friends and they shouldn't be your friends because they're of the world. What, what, we're, what God told us to be is a neighbor like the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan did the right thing toward the man on the road. He didn't try to become his friend. He didn't say, oh, I love you. I think you're awesome. And I just want to build you up with all these positive statements. He didn't do that. He did what the person needed. The person needed physical help. So he picked the person up, took him to a hotel, put put salve on him and all that stuff, and then paid for his well-being for the next several days or whatever. Do what people need. What people need is they need to hear the truth. They don't need to hear positive statements. They got all the positive statements when they go to school, when they go to work, when they turn on the television, when they talk to all their secular friends and worldly Christians. They'll get every positive statement that's ever been stated. But from you, they need the truth because you're a child of God. You're an evangelist and you're there to tell them the truth. So tell people the truth. That's what they really need. Um, I remember one time I told a girl who was a lesbian, I, I just gently and lovingly explained to her that homosexuals who continue in that sin will not go to heaven. And I just explained to her the Bible verses. And guess what? A couple weeks later, she wasn't a lesbian anymore. I didn't, I didn't love on her as they call and tell her that she's awesome and try to pump her up. I just told her the truth and that changed her life. She wasn't saved yet, but her life was, was altered. And um, when you simply tell people the truth, it will have an impact. Um, anyway, so here the Lord Jesus tells, tells Peter the truth. He, he warns him. He says, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, Jesus could have pumped um, Peter up, which is what the church tells us we're supposed to do to people today. But Jesus didn't pump him up. He, he, he rebuked him, basically. He warned him. He gave him a warning. And that's what people need a lot of times. They need a warning. When somebody is running headlong into the pit of hell, they need a warning, not flattery. Okay, or cookies. <laughs> Prepare your heart in advance to understand how Satan uses rejection. Satan will try to make you feel ashamed of the gospel. He'll try to make you feel ashamed of being a Christian. So prepare yourself ahead of time. He will try to shame you and try to make you feel rejected and alone. Look, the Pharisees were always on Jesus' tell. They were constantly harassing him and falsely accusing him and ridiculing him. Here they say, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And they're yelling at him. It's, a question. it's an exclamation point. They're screaming at him, telling him that he's breaking the law. Now, to you and I, this could really make us uneasy emotionally. This could really throw us off emotionally. But Jesus didn't get thrown off. He knew that rejection was coming. He was prepared for it. And he knew who he was. He's, he, was the son, he is the son of God. And he was telling the truth. Don't be ashamed of telling the truth. Now, I have gotten ashamed when I told people the gospel before. But when I walked away, the Holy Spirit just said, you know, Maria, why are you ashamed? You just told them the truth. Don't be ashamed. It's a tactic that Satan uses to shut us up. So don't fall for it because it'll shut you up every time. Prepare your heart in advance to understand how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit is not a performer, okay? He's not there for our entertainment, which means that a lot of the times when you share the gospel with somebody, you're not going to instantly see their life change right before your eyes. That doesn't mean that you wasted your time. Sometimes people will walk away. Sometimes people will curse you. Um, sometimes people will make fun of you. That doesn't mean that you wasted your time. In Mark 10, 22, Jesus told the man to give up his, his riches, and the man just walked away sad. 
because he loved his, his riches more than he loved Jesus. But this doesn't mean that the man never repented and never got saved. Somewhere down the road, that man could have repented later on and truly come into the kingdom of God. You don't know what's going to happen to that person's life later. They might look at you like you're nutso, or they might um, tell you to leave them alone. Um, and they might say, I don't want to talk, you know, I don't want to have this conversation anymore. That's fine. But that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit, that the seed hasn't been planted. So don't get depressed. Don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Yes, the conversation is over. But you, but, but just know you, you did God's work and you can still go to the next person to share the gospel. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, prepare your heart in advance to understand that Jesus is in you. Um, so if he is in you, then everything, every time you share the gospel, it's really him talking to people. It isn't you. So it isn't about you. It's about Jesus. And that's why Jesus told one of the apostles, when they reject you, they're actually rejecting me, not you. And I think he, think he told that to Paul. Um, he said, don't worry, because they're not, they're not rejecting you. They're actually rejecting me. It was either Paul or Peter. I can't remember. But anyway, um, so when you get rejected, just know that they're actually rejecting Jesus. And when you see victory, when somebody gets saved, no, again, it's not you, it's Jesus. <laughs> Jesus did it. So we can be humble and we can also be at peace when we're sharing the gospel. Don't try to be right, instead speak truth. Jesus Christ is not right. Right, right is a human thing. It's a human effort. It's a human accomplishment. Um, it's like, I got the math problem right. Okay, but God is the one who created math. God is truth. So, you know what I mean? You wouldn't have even known that math problem if it weren't for God. So humans can be right, but Jesus Christ is truth. So try to focus on the truth. The truth is Jesus Christ. Keep the conversation focused on Jesus. And I easily fall for this one because I like I like debates. I like intellectual thoughts. So I can easily fall for being right. So a lot of times the Holy Spirit will tell me to just be quiet. Stop. Don't, don't argue the point to try to be right. Be quiet. Let the other person say what they want to say. Make sure that whatever you're saying is simply what the Bible says. And then you're speaking truth. Don't try to make up a whole bunch of logic, logical arguments to prove yourself, which I, I tend to do. So this is kind of for me. Um, so Jesus is truth. So keep it on Jesus. Now Mark 8.38 says, For whoever is ashamed of me, and this verse helped me a lot when it came to sharing the gospel, this verse really helps me. Because it says, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So on Judgment Day, when Jesus returns, whoever has been ashamed of Jesus will not go up in the clouds with him. And on Judgment Day, whoever has been ashamed of Jesus, Jesus will deny him before the Father. And that person will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So this is a great motivation to not be ashamed. <laughs> Even when people make fun of you, if you lose your job, um, if your neighbors hate you, um, if your family and the church people at church think you're a psycho, this is great motivation to continue on, press on, keep sharing the gospel with other people. Um, because if you're ashamed of the gospel, Jesus is going to be ashamed of you. So I love that verse. It gives me a lot of motivation. Now I'm going to go into little tips that you can use with people who have certain ideologies or certain beliefs things that you can share with them that might help them um, get get closer to Jesus or understand him better. One of the hangups that Mormons have is that they do not they they think that they are God and that Jesus is 
just a God and that all of us are God. But the Bible may, the, the Mormons also think that all of us originated from heaven and that we had a life in heaven before we came to earth. This is not scriptural at all. Not at all. There is only one person who came down from heaven, and it was Jesus Christ. So this is one of the hangups that Mormons have, and you can share these verses with them that show that Jesus is the only person who came from heaven and came to earth. And when he did that, it was a great colossal act of humility. It was a massive act of humility for him to leave the glory of God. He is God, but he left his own glory to come down here and dwell on earth with us. And then he suffered even more humiliation on the cross. So Jesus is the most humble person, period. No competition whatsoever. And when we claim that we came from heaven, that's blasphemy. And it's the opposite of humility. Jesus, who actually did come from heaven, came down here. None of us made a choice to come down from heaven because we're not humble like he is. We're prideful, and that's why we need to repent. Uh, and yes, these verses are helpful. Now, some people would would say, oh, no, these are condemning verses. These will make people hurt. You know, no, they're not. They're helpful because they're the truth. People want the truth. That's what people are seeking all over the world. New Age people, Mormons, everybody is seeking the truth. Um, so people appreciate hearing the truth. Um, they might be shocked, surprised, startled, and sometimes annoyed, but they still appreciate it. Ultimately, usually they do. Um, and I've had people thank me for telling them what the Bible says. Um, a couple of times people have actually thanked me, even though I didn't see them get saved in that moment. But they said, wow, I, I never knew that. No one ever told me that before. So don't be afraid to tell people the truth. Okay, so New Age, one of two of their hangups, one of them is that they, um, they think that all of us are sons of God. <laughs> Just like the Mormons, they basically think all of us are God. There's only one son of God. Um, Jesus actually died on the cross because he claimed to be the one and only son of God. And none of us have ever did that. And if we did do that, some they'd put us on a cross too. <laughs> but we're but so new age people are really deceiving themselves. Um, they don't even understand the concept of being a son of God. And they're definitely not a son of God. Um, yeah, all of us are children of God when we when we obey him and follow him. There's only one son of God. There's only one only begotten son of God. Also, in order to be a son of God, you must be the holy one. You must be perfectly holy, and none of us are holy. None of us are perfectly holy, okay? Uh, we can be holy to a certain extent as we obey uh, the commandments of Jesus Christ, but none of us do it perfectly. But Jesus is perfectly holy. So to think that you're the son of God um, in that same sense that Jesus was, uh, you you would have to be holy. And I think New Age people would agree that they're not holy. They watch rated R movies. Some of them look at porn. Um, some of them fornicate um, and do different things. So they're not holy. Um, they're not holy people. They also um, have a hang up with, um, they don't understand that, that there had to be uh, a price paid for our sin. Um, so not only did Jesus take up his cross, um, but also he asks the Christian to take up their cross. And in the New Age religion, you don't have to take up your cross. You don't have to die to yourself. You can have everything you want. You can have a healthy body with your vegan diet. And you can have in your yoga and to make your body nice. And you can enjoy sensual pleasures um, if they have sexual sin and, and other stuff. If they go to the spa and all that kind of thing is fine. 
So they're not denying themselves. A, a new age person can have lots of money and keep it to themselves and not share it. So there's no self-denial. And uh, Jesus denied himself and he requires us to, to deny ourselves. So that's something, those are some things that you can share with a new age person. Um, that they really aren't getting closer to becoming God. It's impossible. And, and if they want to get closer to God in a relationship way, they're going to have to take up their cross. Uh, Muslims, one of their big hang-ups hang is that they don't think it's possible for God to have a son. But even in the Old Testament, so they they think the whole Son of God teaching is only a teaching of the New Testament and that it's all hogwash. But it actually goes back to the Old Testament. And the Old Testament was written before the Quran was written. And there's a verse in the Quran that says that every Bible verse is true. So um, if every Bible verse is true, then God does have a son. Because the New Testament says he has a son. And lo and behold, the Old Testament also says he has a son. This is just a few verses. It's not all of them. Exodus 15.6 talks about the right hand of God. And Job 40.14 talks about the right hand giving salvation. Now, in ancient times, and Muslims should be able to understand this because Muslims value the father-son relationship, and they value the family. So they should be able to understand this, that your son is literally your right hand. The, the, the ancient right-hand man is a man's son, especially his firstborn son. It's his right hand, because the son takes on the occupation of the father and does that he works for the father his entire life and does everything that the father wants in the ancient times um, sons like if your father was a carpenter you became a carpenter if your father was a farmer you became a farmer if your father was a well uh you know um, somebody who works with metal you you worked with metal and then everything you did was to protect your father's property and to protect your father's rights, and to protect all your father's claims. Um, so everything you did, it was almost like you were your father's bodyguard, your father's servant, everything. So Muslims understand what the right hand means. It literally means somebody's son. So these two verses are talking about the son of God. In Proverbs 34, it actually literally states that God has a son. It says, Who went up to heaven and cometh down? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound waters in a garment? And basically, who's in control of nature and who created nature? Who established all ends of the earth? What is his name? Remember, his name is unpronounceable. That's why God only gave Moses Y-H-W-H, -H, because it cannot be pronounced. Um, what is his name? No one can pronounce God's name. And what is son's name? Surely you know it. Now, this part is sarcastic. Surely you know is the sarcastic part of the verse. But he does have a son. So this is all going all the way back to Proverbs. God has a son. And all the verses about the right hand, there's lots of them. Those are all talking about Jesus. So Jehovah's Witness, one of their big hang-ups is they do not believe that Jesus is God. And he is God. Now, there are hundreds of verses in the Bible. Literally hundreds of verses in the Bible that say that Jesus is God. And I'm not making that up. I've read the Bible at least 90 times from the beginning to the end from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. I know what I'm talking about. There are hundreds of verses in the Bible that say that Jesus is God, both in the Old and the New Testament. Um, and he is God. <laughs> Even he himself said he was God. And here is one example. In Exodus, God called himself, I am. And in John 8, 
58, Jesus called himself, I am. And not only that, Jesus didn't only say, I am. He said he was before Abraham, which meant he existed before Abraham existed. And he said this in the New Testament, and Abraham existed, I don't know what, two or, th or 3,000 years before the New Testament. Um, so Abraham was one of the earliest people on the planet. So um, Jesus definitely said he was God. And this is only one verse showing that. There's dozens of verses in the New Testament from both Jesus and the apostles showing that he is God. And then there's a whole bunch of Old Testament verses prophesying that he is God and saying that he is God. Anyway, he's definitely God. <laughs> so that's something that you can talk to people about. What, what I have noticed about the Seventh-day Adventist, now I'm not saying that no Seventh-day Adventist is saved, because I think a lot of them are saved. I think a lot of them are genuine Christians. One of the hangups that they have is with lifestyle Christianity. Um, so if it's a Seventh-day Adventist who doesn't really know the gospel, which a lot of them don't because they're taught lifestyle Christianity, they're not really taught the gospel. Um, they're taught that they can only eat certain things and that they can't smoke and they can't drink. So it's all and it's all about lifestyle, and they're saved by following the rules. Um, so this, these verses you can share with them that totally obliterate all of their teachings because they're told that they they can't eat meat and animal products. Well, in all of these verses, God is commanding humans to eat meat. <laughs> they're actually commanded to eat meat in Exodus. God commanded the people to eat the eat lamb every single year for the during the Passover ceremony. They're commanded to eat lamb. They have to eat lamb to celebrate the Passover. In Deuteronomy, God says these are all the foods that you can eat. The clean foods are the are the ox, the lamb, the sheep, the kid, the goats, and a whole bunch of other ones. Then in John 21, after Jesus is resurrected, and there's other times when before Jesus died on the cross when he ate meat with people. But even after he's resurrected, he tells them to eat fish. He commands his disciples to sit down and have a meal of fish with him. In Acts 10, um, Peter has a vision in which God tells him to not only eat meat, but to eat unclean meat. Okay, and he is commanded. Now, this is another thing. Seventh day Adventists are told that it's a sin to kill animals. Well, look at the words of God here rise up, kill, and eat. Now, this, this says slay, but that means kill. Rise up, get up, Peter, kill, and eat. And it's talking about eating unclean animals. It's saying, kill the octopus and eat it, kill the shrimp and eat it. Those are unclean. And Peter is being told he's being commanded by God. Now that that's because God wants him to be an evangelist and go to foreign countries where they eat unclean things, and he wants them. He he wants Peter to sit down and eat un, so-called unclean food in order to evangelize people. And from this point on, from Acts ten on, no food is is any more unclean, and that's why it's not a sin to kill. It's not a sin to eat meat, and it's not a sin to eat, you know, octopus and pig. You can eat pig and you're not sinning. Because we're supposed to be evangelizing people who eat all these things. Okay, so continuing on, um, when it comes to lifestyle Christianity, and Seventh-day Adventists are not the only ones that suffer from this. Lots of different churches suffer from this. But it's basically following the rules of men. And Jesus said, when we follow the rules of men, we're really following the rules of hypocrisy. We're not following God when we do what men demand that we do. We're not following God. It isn't Jesus' commandment 
no, to abstain from meat. It is not his commandment. His commandment is to abstain from adultery and murder and all that other stuff and unforgiveness. He says, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people doth draw nigh to me with their mouth and with the lips it doth honor me in their heart. But their heart is far from me, and in vain do they worship me, teaching teachings, commands of men. And having called near the multitude, he said to them, Hear and understand, not that which is coming. It isn't what goes into your mouth that defiles you, but what comes out of your mouth. So you can eat, you can eat pig, and you're not defiled. You can eat dirt, and you're not defiled. What defiles you is the things that you say, and what, what defiles you is what comes out of your heart. The, the lust, the evil desires, the unforgiveness, that's what defiles. Um, anyway, it's if when you follow a man's commands, you're you're the blind following the blind. So this these are good verses that you can share with somebody who's a day dentist. If they're basically a Satanist or they're practicing witchcraft, I think one of their hang-ups is that they think Satan has power. Well, Satan has power the same way that a horse has power or a flower has power. The flower has been given the power from God to sprout up and to blossom, right? And a horse has been given power from God to run and to neigh. But, but it's just what they only have. They can only do what God allows them to do. And Satan is the same way. He can only do what God allows him to do. So what, what they need to realize is somebody who practices witchcraft needs to realize is this verse, Jesus saw Satan falling from heaven like lightning. Now, witches think that this means that Satan is powerful, but it means the opposite. Falling is not a good thing. It didn't say that he descended from heaven. It said that he fell from heaven like lightning. He fell in judgment and defeat. He didn't he didn't descend um, in power. He fell. He was thrown from heaven. Also, Satan cannot create. Witches think witches think that Satan creates things. And this is categorically untrue. There is only one creator and that creator is God. And that creator created all things, including Satan. Okay? Satan is a creature, not a creator. And so this is something, First Colossians 1.16, you can share with them. Also, Matthew 25.41, hell was, was prepared by God. Hell, hell itself was created by God. See, witches think that Satan created hell and that Satan has thrones in hell and that Satan can give them a throne in hell and that hell can be fun and that Satan is going to throw a party for them in hell. Satan has no power over hell. Absolutely no power. He did not create it. He did not, if there is a throne in hell, he didn't make it. He, the, the laws of hell are all created and governed by God and is the one who's in charge of hell, God is the one who created hell. Hell is a, tor a place of torment for the devil and his angels. Satan is going there if he isn't there already. Um, and if, if Satan has a throne, it's a throne of torment. It's, it's not something you, anybody would want to sit on. It's a throne of fire and torment. And Satan cannot give a throne to anybody in hell. He cannot give a cell anybody in hell. He cannot give a pit to anybody in hell. Only God can do that. Satan has no power over hell. So it's so they're not going to go there and have a party. Satan isn't going to give them any gifts when they get to hell. He, a lot of Satanists are looking forward to hell because they think it's going to be a party room. And it's not because Satan isn't in charge of it. And even if Satan were, Satan is a liar, so he would never actually throw a party for anybody who serves him anyway. He would, tor he would torment by his own will. He would torment anybody who serves him. Um, so their, their whole 
idea that Satan is powerful is completely false. That's what I like to share with witches if I talk to them. Um, homosexual and fornicators. Um, I like to share with them the fact that every single sexual sin is an abomination. This is only a partial list of all the sins, sexual sins in the Bible. Um, there's more than this list. So it doesn't matter what kind of sexual sin you're into. All of it is an abomination. All of it separates you from God. It doesn't matter what you're doing. So with homosexuals, I, I like to let them know, hey, I used to be in sexual sin too. I used to commit fornication and, and adultery. And um, I was on my way to hell. And there, everybody who commits sexual sin is going to hell. All of us have to repent. So we're all, what I usually tell homosexual people is we're all in the same boat. It isn't like you're the only one committing an, an abomination. Most people on the planet committed sexual abomination. And everybody has to repent. And most of the people who go to church have committed sexual abomination. And either they already repented or they still need to repent. So homosexuals think that they're um, worse than everybody else or that they're made to feel worse. And it's just not true. They're not, they're not worse. They're in the exact same boat as everybody else. So I like to tell them how I had to repent. And, and God God loves them, too, and wants them to repent so that they can go to heaven, too. And then fornicators, I like to remind them the exact same thing. They're in the same boat with the homosexuals. <laughs> because a lot of fornicators think, well, as long as I'm not a homosexual, I'm not sinning. And that isn't true at all. Because every single sin here is an act of fornication. Fornication is any sex outside of marriage. And all of these sexual acts are outside of marriage. So fornicators are definitely in big trouble with God. They need to repent. God isn't just upset about homosexuals. He's upset about every sexual. So that's why I like to share with people who are in sexual sin. And um, if somebody is suicidal... Um, now this I've never actually told anybody before, but this is what I would tell somebody if they told me they were suicidal. Um, actually, I think I have told this to somebody before, but I don't think that they were suicidal. Um, but, but a lot of times these people think that they have a right to kill themselves, but actually they don't. They have to repent of that. And so I would just lovingly tell them, you know what, if you kill yourself, you're committing murder. <laughs> because you're killing a human being. You are a human being. If you kill a human being, it's called murder because God loves everybody. He loves you as much as he loves your neighbor. So you know it's a sin to kill your neighbor, but it's also that makes it a sin to kill you too because your life is just as precious as your neighbor's life. And I think this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, is misused a lot. But for somebody who's suicidal or depressed, this is a good verse for them because God does have a plan for their life. And in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. And, and if we can't feel his love, it's because we've never known him. We need to know God and then we will feel his love and we'll, be, we'll feel his love for us. And then we'll be able to love ourselves and love our neighbor. That's why Jesus said, love yourself, as, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you hate yourself, how can you love your neighbor? So, you, so we have to love ourselves in a holy way, not in a selfish way, but in a holy way. We, we have to love ourselves in order to be able to love our neighbor properly. And we will never be able to love ourselves unless we know the love of God. We need to seek the love of God. And he definitely has a plan for us. And it is absolutely a sin to commit suicide because suicide is a form of murder. It is murder, just like abortion is murder. We don't have a right to kill anybody. Um, the Baptist. Now, I think some Baptists 
are saved. And I think there's going to be a lot of Baptists in heaven. But there's there's a lot of Baptists who aren't saved. And it's because of this false doctrine, what's saved, always saved. So they think that if they said the salvation prayer, they're guaranteed their ticket to heaven. And that's not biblical at all. Now, again, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of verses in both the Old and the New Testament that prove that once saved, always saved is a lie. I've only listed three verses here. There are dozens, literally dozens, and I'm not exaggerating. I've read the whole Bible many, many times, and there are dozens of verses. It would take hours to go over all the verses that prove that you can lose your salvation. Hours. But I'm just going to, I just have three of them here. Um, one that I forgot to put here was the one that's in Hebrews that says that if you, if you were a Christian, if you followed, if you, if you gave your heart to the Lord, but then you went back to sin, there's no more a sacrifice for you. Um, Jesus' blood on the cross doesn't cover you if you go back into sin. So that, that also disproves once saved, always saved. That does show that you can lose your salvation if you go back into a life of sin. Um, but so do all these verses. This verse here, I think, is one of the most important ones because it proves if you're, if you're doing any of those things, if you're fornicating, if you're if you have idols, if you are in adultery, if you if you are in homosexual sodomite activity, if you're stealing, if you're coveting, if you if you drink, you if you get drunk or high, if you revive, if you slander people, um, if you take money that isn't yours, you will not enter the kingdom of God. And many people who think that they were once saved, always saved, fall into this category, these categories. But here the Bible clearly says they will not enter the kingdom of God. Again, um, down here in Matthew 7, 21, 23, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons, done many wonders in your name? And he will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, which means you who continue in sin and have not repented of your sins. Even if we serve God as a minister in front of the church, that doesn't guarantee us a ticket to heaven. You can be a pastor your entire life and still go to hell because you never repented of your own sins. You can be a Christian who said the salvation prayer. And still go to hell because you won't give up your coveting or your or your lying or your stealing. So so anybody who practices lawlessness is not going to enter the kingdom. There's no such thing as once saved, always saved. And Jesus always preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He didn't say say the salvation prayer for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said repent. We have to repent. That's 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 required. There's no way there's no way to be saved unless we repent. Okay, so drug users, these verses might help them. Um, I like to mention this to people because a lot of people who use drugs don't know this. That in the Bible, sorcery comes from the word pharmakeia, which is drugs. And both witches and pagans and occultists and ancient, you know, um, Chinese and ancient Indians used pharmakeia, which is drugs, to alter their state of mind. And even the New Age people have done it. Um, they alter their mind and to enter into the spiritual realm. That's sorcery. That's an act of sorcery. So even though a lot of people don't want to practice witchcraft, the fact that they're taking drugs makes make it makes it that they're practicing witchcraft. So I like to let people know that, that, hey, did you know that taking drugs is witchcraft? And that will help them to repent because they really don't want to practice witchcraft. They just wanted to get high. So, so I inform them, hey, you're not just getting high. You're actually practicing witchcraft. You're actually practicing sorcery according to the Bible. 
So then that, that can encourage a person to repent. Um, and this is another thing. A lot of people want to take marijuana. Marijuana was created by God. Satan did not make marijuana. Satan can't create anything. God created marijuana. It's an herb of the field. He created it for us to eat. <laughs> okay. And in Revelation, he didn't create it for us to smoke. Okay. He didn't create anything for us to get high on. He, he doesn't. He's a sorcery is a sin. But eating the herbs of the field is not a sin. Um, so if you can eat it in a way that you're not getting any kind of high, that that's what it was made for. It was made for our nourishment. Um, I, I stay away from it because obviously I don't trust the products. I, I don't trust the people who make marijuana products. I don't know if there's high chemicals in there or not, so I stay away from it. But I know that it's an herb and it was originally created to be eaten. In Revelation, even the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. When we go to heaven, we're going to be eating the leaves of the tree of life, but we're not going to be smoking them. Okay? When people smoke and, and do chemical stuff, it's creation to get high. That's sorcery. But if we simply eat what was given to us as food, that's there's nothing wrong with that. God gave us food for healing. So hopefully they can think rightfully. God wants you to be nourished in your body, uh, but he doesn't want you to be high. That's sorcery. So there's they need to discern um, and take care of their body properly. Um, and... Jesus can cast out the demon that's causing the addiction. Believe me, if you're addicted, you have a demon. Um, even if you're a Christian, if you're addicted, you have a demon. And it needs to be cast out. And it can only be cast out by faith and by the power of God. So um, I, you don't have to say any, any hocus pocus, pocus cantations you don't have to speak any certain way. You don't have to say, you know, there's a lot of religious Christians who say, oh, you got to cast it out this way. You got to cast it out. That way. You got to cast it out this way. No, 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 no. All you have to do is believe. So here's a simple prayer for anybody who needs a demon cast out. Jesus Christ, I honor you as God, and I know that you have authority over every demon, and I know that you do not want me to deal with this addiction. You don't want me to suffer from this addiction and this demonic bondage. And I humbly come to you and I ask you, Jesus, to cast it out of me in your, in your power. And I give you all the glory and all the credit for casting this demon out. And I believe in faith from this point on that you have delivered it have delivered me of this deed. And I now walk in faith and I walk in with you alive in me. I walk with your spirit in me, Lord. And I ask you to open my eyes to my own deliverance. And I receive my own deliverance now in your holy name. You don't have to fill anything. You don't have to say anything right. You don't need goosebumps. You don't need uh, shivers. Just believe and give Jesus all the glory and ask him to do the work. You don't even literally have to cast it out yourself. Now you can, you can, um, you can say demon, demon of, you know, um, marrow, demon of marijuana. I command you out of my body right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, go and never come back. That simple. But all it takes is faith. And if you don't have the faith that you can cast it out, then ask Jesus to do it for you. Believe him. Put your faith in him. Ask him to do it for you. And when you do cast it out, know that it's Jesus actually doing the work. You're not doing anything. You don't have any power. It's Jesus. It's by his name that it goes, not by your name. So always give God the credit. If you don't have the faith to cast it out yourself, that's perfectly fine. Jesus will take it out anyway. <laughs> Just ask him. He'll do it. Don't be afraid. Okay. Um, 
So there's apostate Christians. Now there's a big difference, massive difference between a Christian who's struggling with sin and doesn't want to sin and hates sin, but they can't stop versus a Christian who loves sin and revels in it and, and thinks that they're going to heaven even though they're sinning. An apostate Christian is a Christian who loves sin and has no desire to repent. That's an apostate Christian. Okay? But there are many Christians who hate their sin, but they, they're addicted. They have an addiction and they're struggling. Those people need deliverance, okay? And they simply need to pray for deliverance and just keep praying until they have the faith to believe that Jesus has delivered them. But the apostate person needs to understand the gospel better. Um, apostates will go to hell because they're practicing sin. And here in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, it tells us very clearly that if you're practicing sin, you will go to hell. You will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't matter if you go to church every Sunday. It doesn't matter if you pray amen before every meal. It doesn't matter if you read Bible verses. It doesn't matter if you have a Jesus t-shirt. If you're walking in willful sin, you are not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. You have not entered the kingdom of heaven. And so apostate people need to realize this, that, that God does not allow sin. He doesn't allow Christians to sin. Everybody has to repent, including Christians. And in Revelation, um, he also talks about the the church that um, has the Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, but she teaches and seduces the church into committing sexual immorality and eating things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. And I find that most people who are apostate are in some sort of sexual sin. They may be in other sin as well, but a lot of them are practicing some sort of sexual sin. Um, and they think it's okay with God. Not okay. Okay, because look what happens to Jezebel. I will cast her into a sick bed in hell, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. Okay, so if when people are apostate, they don't think God knows how evil their heart is. But he does. He knows all the evil. He knows that they're full of lust. They're full of greed. They're full of pride. They're full of unforgiveness. He knows it. And he will judge them one day. And so they need to know this. They are in danger of hellfire. And you don't have to scream at people to tell them this. Simply show them the Bible verses. And if they reject it, that's between them and God. But people do need to hear the truth. A lot of times people are apostate because they've never been told the truth by anybody. And so they don't even know. So that's why we need to share the truth with people. Like I say, there's a lot of people who fornicate and take drugs because nobody ever told them it was a sin. They haven't read the Bible. So we need to show them that, that it is a sin. Now, ap apostolic is actually one of the truth one of the Protestant churches. And apostolic in and of itself is not uh, a false doctrine. But I have noticed that in apostolic churches, there is a massive obsession with the appearance and the submission of women. And, and they'll, they're totally obsessed. Like when you go, to, go into an apostolic church, you'll see that the women all have long dresses, no makeup, their hair is in a bun, different things like that. They're, they're in submission, uh, not only under their un own husband, but under the, um, the pastor. They have to submit to the pastor. A lot of them have to wear head coverings, all kinds of crazy, ridiculous stuff. Um, keep in mind, Jesus never once in the Bible spoke about women's roles. And this shows how little important the topic is. It's not a salvation topic. But in apostolic churches, they act like you're going to lose your salvation or you've never been saved if you're wearing pants. If you're wearing ladies' slacks, you're not saved. 
or if you don't have a head cover and you're not saved, or if you don't put yourself under the pastor's, um, you know, submit to the pastor as his, as his wife, basically, you're not saved. Jesus never even spoke of these things. And that's because Jesus preached the gospel pure and clear. He didn't go into side topics. And this is definitely a side topic. Now, Paul touched on it when he wrote to the Corinthian church. He didn't, he didn't preach it to every single church, just the Corinthians, because they had particular issues that were going on. And he gave them particular advice and words of wisdom for their church. But the same Paul who talked to the Corinthians about how women should dress and act also said that he fell under the leadership of Phoebe. And he also honored women like Priscilla for their leadership in the church. So this shows that Paul did consider all Christians equal, which he told the Galatian church. He said, there's neither male nor female in the body of Christ. We're all, we're all equal. So Paul was not obsessed with women submitting to men. But a lot of people read the Corinthians uh, books and then they get all obsessed about it because Paul discussed submission with the Corinthians. But what they forget is in the same Corinthians, you know, the two books of Corinthians, well, actually here it is in Ephesians, Paul wrote, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself. This means he died for her. So in these same apostolic churches where they're totally obsessed with women submitting to men, which was never Paul's commandment anyway. Paul only commanded wives to submit to their husbands. He never commanded women to submit to men. He only commanded wives to submit their hu their husbands. He never commanded women to submit to the path of the church. Only wives to their husbands. Why is this? Because only your husband gives you children. Only your husband puts bread on the table. Only your husband provides shelter. So no woman has to submit to the pastor except his own wife, because unless he's gonna unless he's gonna provide home shelter and children for all those women, he doesn't deserve for them to submit to him. You submit to the person who takes care of you. Christ took care of the church, so the church submits to Christ. The church doesn't submit to Buddha or or, or, or Muhammad. The church only submits to Christ because everything we have comes from Christ. And a wife only submits to her husband because her husband provides for her needs and gives her children. The pastor doesn't do that. You don't, you don't submit to the pastor. So Paul only said that wives submit to their husband. But the same Paul also said that a husband should die for his wife. Now what's harder? Submitting? Or dying for somebody. It's a lot harder to die for somebody. So while they're obsessing about women's appearance and submission, they never make any mention of a man dying for his wife, which is a lot harder to do. It was a lot harder for Christ to die for us on the cross than it is for any of us to obey him. Mark my words. If obedience to Christ is a drop in the bucket. It's so easy compared to getting up on that cross as God and dying for everybody else's sins. Jesus did the hard thing. And a husband is called to do what's hard for his wife. He's called to give his life for his wife if necessary. Um, the easy thing is to submit. But these churches are so obsessed about submission. Okay? And that's not, that's not what the gospel is all about. So anyway, it's a good thing to share with them. Um, I'm going to have to finish this later. So just to repeat, um, a lot of the people that are in different Protestant sects, sects are, are Christians. They are saved. Um, 
but sometimes because of false teaching, some of the people in those sects are not saved. So I'm just going over the some of the things that people get taught that can actually be a stumbling block that can keep them from getting saved. So with the Amish and the Mennonites, they get taught that it's basically like a works salvation religion. They get taught that they're saved by obeying the rules and obeying the leaders, but they don't really get taught salvation. So um, a lot of times when they get saved is when they actually hear that they can't earn their salvation by following rules. They can't earn it by their works. And it's only by the glory of God. So this is where these verses really come in. Um, good is when you're trying to witness to Amish, um, letting them know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So even their leaders have sinned and fallen short. Um, and then in Romans 9, it says, um, because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were <clears throat> by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. So when we try to receive salvation by works, <clears throat> by following rules, it becomes a stumbling block. And then in Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Now, the Baptists take this and they say that the works is repentance and that therefore you don't have to repent to be saved. But that isn't what this is talking about. This is talking about religious works, following the, ordin the ordinances, uh, following the rules, um, it isn't talking about repentance. We do have to repent to be saved, to be saved, but we can't be saved by following ordinances, which is what the Amish and the Mennonite and the Jews do. Um, so um, the Baptists take these verses <laughs> and sometimes go the far opposite direction and think and them think that they can sin and they're still saved. But the Amish take it in the opposite direction where they're literal, literally are practicing work salvation. Um, so anyway, it's good for them to know that, that they're saved by grace and they're saved by faith. They're not saved by following rules. Um, <clears throat> so the Pentecostal community Again, there's a lot of Christians that are truly born again <clears throat> that are Pentecostal. But some of them um, think that, you know, you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit or else you, you aren't really a Christian. And that isn't true because if you look at Luke 24, 43, the, the guy on the cross next to Jesus, he repented of his sins. And he called on Jesus for salvation. And Jesus said, today <clears throat> you will be with me in paradise. But that man did not get baptized in water or the fire of the Holy Spirit. And yet he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He had faith and he was saved. So this shows you that you don't have to be physically baptized for salvation physical baptism in water is an act of faith, but it, it isn't required for salvation. And you also don't have to be baptized in the fire of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues to be saved. Um, John 20, 22, and when he said this, he breathed. Now this is when Jesus resurrected, but he hadn't ascended yet to heaven. He breathed on them, and that is the disciples. He breathed on the 12, the 11 disciples, because Judas was already dead, and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, they weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit at that point. But they had re been filled with the Holy Spirit. They already had the Holy Spirit. So again, you don't have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit before Pentecost. 
in Acts 1-4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them. <clears throat> now this is also before he ascended. He, Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Now the promise of the Father was that the Holy Spirit would come down and baptize them. They weren't waiting for salvation. They were already filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with faith. Their lives had already changed. And the evidence of that is that when they went to Jerusalem, they, they, they stayed up and prayed for days. And I don't mean that they never slept. But they prayed for days in full faith. Now, before Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into them, they weren't capable of staying awake for five minutes. Remember the night that Jesus um, got arrested? They couldn't keep their eyes open for five minutes and pray. But after he breathed the Holy Spirit into them, then they prayed for days. They're, they were dramatically changed from that moment, from John 20. So in Acts 1, they were waiting for the promise of the Father, which was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They weren't waiting for salvation. Um, and so these three verses kind of help, might help some people to not be so obsessed with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, we don't have to be obsessed with it. Yes, it is necessary. Yes, it is good but people can be saved before they've received it. Um, so then there's the prosperity gospel. And again, I know some people who are in the prosperity gospel, but they love Jesus with all their heart, and they're really seeking him, but they listen to prosperity preachers. I believe they're saved. I'm gonna, I believe that if I make it to heaven, I'm going to see them in heaven too. Um. But if somebody is in the prosperity gospel and they're not saved, this could be why. Because of this false teaching about money. Um, they actually teach a love of money. So in the early church in Acts, they had all things in common, which meant they shared all of their possessions and all of their wealth to make sure that nobody was poor in the church. So those who had more shared with those who had less. Now, in the prosperity gospel, you don't share. The only person you share with is the pastor. But in the Acts church, they, didn't, they weren't giving money to the apostles, except for their basic needs and for travel. They gave their money to the poor who were among them. That was where the lion's share of the tithing went, the so-called tithing. I mean, let's, let's just call it tithing for lack of a better term, okay? But that's where the extra money went. It went to the poor. It was distributed among the poor. It didn't go, you know, they didn't all give it. Um, but the pastors, the, the apostles sometimes got money for their ministry. Uh, but they didn't have like a regular salary. They weren't, they didn't have a regular salary. But when the church knew that Paul needed something, they would send it to him, you know. Um, and when the church knew that their the widows needed, they would send it. They would give it to them every single week. They would they would give money to the widows. So it's almost like the widows were on salary, but the apostles weren't. So that's completely opposite of what you see in the prosperity gospel. In the prosperity gospel, nobody shares but everybody gives part of their wealth to the pastor and makes him a billionaire or a millionaire. And that's not Christian at all. There were no millionaires in the early church. Everybody shared. So, um, and Jesus actually said, blessed are you poor for yours is the kingdom of God in Luke 6, 20. Now there is another verse where he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. In this verse, he said, blessed are the poor, and he meant the poor. He didn't mean the poor in spirit. He meant the poor. In 1 Timothy 6, 6, 10, 1 Timothy 6, 10, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So when you love money, sorrow is the end result. Your life will be destroyed. And I've heard... 
many stories of people who chased after money and ended in ruin and sorrow. Um, there's a pastor who calls him name, his last name is Dollar. He loves money. He dances on dollar, on dollar bills at the altar. And he says, give me money. So he has a lust for money. That's a sin. And it is the root of all evil. Remember, it was Judas who carried the money bag. And it wasn't because Judas cared about the poor. It was because Judas wanted to steal from the, mo the money bag. And a lot of prosperity preachers do the same thing today. They take the money that the church gives them that they should be distributing among the poor in their, in their congregation. Instead, they keep it for themselves. And that's exactly the kind of person that Judas was. Now, did you notice something in the Bible? The very moment, the very moment that Judas made the decision to go to the Pharisees and exchange Jesus' life for, I think it was 30 pieces of silver, the very moment was immediately after the woman poured the ointment, the precious ointment on Jesus and Judas rebuked her, and, and then Jesus said, leave her alone. She's done the right thing. That made Judas so mad because he didn't get to pocket that money, and instead it was, it was poured out on Jesus. That made Judas so angry that he immediately, go look it up in the Bible yourself. I believe it's in John. He immediately left that place and went straight to the Pharisees and said, I'll give you Jesus for, I think it was 30 pieces of silver. Immediately, that's how much Jesus loved money. And that's what happens every week in many churches in America where people are preaching the prosperity gospel. Every week, that pastor is taking money from Jesus, who he wants the poor to have it, and they're taking it for themselves. Okay, so in Mark 12, 43, and having called near his disciples, he said to them, Verily I say to you that this poor widow hath put in more than all those putting into the treasury. He didn't give the widow any money. He didn't say, let's make her rich. He didn't say, let's open up a, um, you know, um, a bank account for her and take a collection. He said, she had given more than the people who were rich. So she had a ruby in her crown that they would never have because she gave out of her poverty, they gave out of their riches. So people who give out of their poverty are way more blessed than those who give out of their riches. So here is an example of how you can be blessed and be poor. Um, now, I'm not saying that Jesus wants you to not have your needs met because the Bible says he meets all of our needs. Um, but, but it isn't a lack of faith when you're poor. It isn't a sin to be poor. And it isn't a curse to be poor. If you're obeying Jesus Christ and you're following him, following him you are not cursed just because you're poor. Paul was poor. Jesus was poor. John the Baptist was poor. And none of them were cursed. So this whole prosperity teaching that if you're poor, you're, you're cursed is false. Very false. Okay. Atheists. Um, basically, atheism is just based on pride. They don't want to humble themselves. So these are some good verses for atheists. Um, in Romans 1, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, all people, are without excuse. And this, this is a great verse for atheists because it says, no matter what your intellectual arguments are, the reality is you know God is real creation. He's proved himself to be real to you because of creation. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge 
of God. So all the intellectual arguments that atheists have are acts of pride that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. They're, they don't want to know God. We need to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Um, so they need to bring their thoughts into captivity and, and submit to Christ. And then they will have gain the knowledge of God. A lot of atheists say, I don't know God. Well, that's your own fault, according to this verse, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. It's our own fault if we don't know God. Because our we are using our intellectual arguments in, in a prideful way against his knowledge, preventing ourselves from having his knowledge. It isn't his fault we don't know him. It's our fault. In Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If you want to know God, he will reveal himself to you. And the problem is a lot of atheists do not want to know God. They love their sin, so they don't want to know God. So just tell them, you know what? If you don't know God again, it's because you haven't asked. You haven't been seeking him. You're seeking false religion, or you're seeking intellectualism, or Darwinism, or humanism, but you're not seeking God, and that's the problem. If you seek him, you will find him. So this is kind of a touchy subject here. There's a lot of Christians who are actually practicing the occult and spiritualism, but they don't know it. Some of them, a few of them know it, but a lot of them don't, and it's because the occult has entered into the church and people who don't read their bible are getting sucked into it without realizing that it's the occult so these verses can help somebody who is practicing occult but they don't realize it the bethel church teaches occultism and there's a lot of other churches that do as well but bethel is kind of the most famous famous church it calls itself christian but its teachings are occult um, so here's some verses that can help so in Leviticus 26 and the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people now a lot of Christians who practice the occult they don't go to mediums and witches so they don't think that this verse applies to them, but it actually does because of the term familiar spirits. Because a lot of what they're dabbling in isn't the Holy Spirit, but another spirit. It's a familiar spirit. So sometimes they'll get what they think is prophecy, but it's actually information from demons. Um, a familiar spirit is a demon who, who gives you information basically, to make a long story short. They know things about history. They know things about other people because they used to walk. You know, demons are thousands of years old, okay? So they've walked with past generations. They've, they've been, they've possessed past generations. And they, they, when one person dies, they, then they jump out of that person and go and possess somebody else. Or they go and hunt, you know, get into somebody else's life. So because of that, they know things about the past. A familiar spirit can, can prophesy things from the past and make up things about the future. Familiar spirits may also know, know Bible verses like Satan does. So then they're, they can pretend to prophesy. So um, if you're dabbling in the occult unknown, you could think that the Holy Spirit's telling you things when it's actually a familiar spirit. So um, I, I don't have time to get into all of it, but there's a, there are people who are actually witches who pretend that they're apostles and pretend that they're teaching people how to, how to, how to be spiritual and how to, how to reach out to God. Um, one of them was William Brannan, and he's, he died a long time ago. But he was actually into, um, what's it called, um, Freemasonry. He was a Freemason. 
and he was teaching Freemasonry, but he never told anybody he was teaching that. He described it as teaching people how to how to connect with God. There's there's New Age people, and I believe one of them is Cat Hare. I think that's her, and I believe she's actually a witch. Um, I don't have proof of that, but um, she 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 teaches people how to connect with God. But it's her her practices are really occult like. I don't have time to get into it, but um but anyway, um so in Jeremiah twenty three thirty two, behold I'm against those who prophesy false dreams. There's a lot of people who prophesy every single week they have a new prophecy. And you don't see that in the old testament or the new testament. You don't see prophets that every single week have a new um, prophecy. And you'll notice that with these modern prophets who have a new prophets, prophecy every week, it's always very vague. They'll say something's happening, but they won't name a date. They'll say coming soon, but then it never happens. Or they do have a date and it never happens. Um, so that's a tip that they're really a false prophet. Jonathan Kahn is a really famous and some of his stuff that he's done, I really like. But I have to admit, he has made prophecies. He has set dates in the past, and nothing came of it. So, so he follows the definition of a false prophet, even though I agree with a lot of the things that he says, and I really do think he loves the world. He actually is a false prophet. Um, Isaiah 9.16 and the eulogists of this people are causing error, and the eulogized ones are consumed. Uh, lots of people eulogize William Brannan, and he was a Freemason, which is witchcraft. It's a form of witchcraft. People, you, you, I've heard people eulogize Joshua, and he was a con artist. Um, he... He was not a Christian at all. He practiced witchcraft. And many people testified of that. And he also basically had a harem of women that he would have sex with on almost a daily basis. He would have sex with a different person of his harem every day. He called it a school of prophets, but literally it, it, it acted like a harem. All these women had sex with him. But people eulogize him. So beware of people who get eulogized. There's there's a false past preachers who I thought were awesome, but when I learned more about them, I realized that they were they had some sort of false teaching. Um, so be beware of eulogies. Um, and then worldly people. These are people, and some of them are in the church, and some of them are out of the church. But they're people who love the world. So these are good Bible verses for them. There are people in the church who chase after money, who all their all they care about is their vacations, their family events, their awards, ceremonies, very worldly things. They don't really have their eyes on Jesus. So, and that's a big trap for Christians and non-Christians. So in First John two two, don't love the world nor the things in the world. Anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is in them. And this is a warning to all of us, including me. When I lust after things of the world, it's a it's a it's a sign that my love for God is diminishing. Mark ten twenty one, and Jesus, having looked upon him, loved him and said to him, "One thing you lack: go away, whatever you and whatever you have, sell and give to the poor." And you will have treasure in heaven and come be following me. Take up your cross. So that the young man loved money. He loved Jesus, but he loved money more. And Jesus said, this is what you lack. I know you love me. I love you. But you love money more. You need to give up money. Sometimes Jesus will ask us to give things up, but we get blessed, you know. I used to want to travel the world. I especially wanted to go to England and Western Europe. Um, and I dreamed about that my whole life. When I finally had money to travel, the Lord spoke to me and he said, Maria, 
you can travel in heaven. And that, the light bulb came on and I'm like, oh, I can give my extra income to, to Jesus now. And when I get to heaven, I can travel heaven. Heaven is millions and billions of times better than anything I can see in this world. So by giving up traveling in Western Europe, one of these days, I'm going to be traveling in heaven. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? We're really not losing anything. When we take up our cross and we turn our back on the world, we lose nothing. It's only gain because this world is passing away. It's going to go up in flames in an instant. And then we're going to be in eternity. And what's in eternity is forever. So we're losing nothing. When you lose your family and you lose your children and you lose your job and you lose your dog and you lose your house and you lose your vacations and you lose your reputation here on earth, you've lost nothing because this earth is going away faster than you can blink. And then in eternity, you'll have all of that and greater, greater, greater. You'll have tons of dogs to play with. You'll have tons of children to take care of. Believe me, there's plenty of babies in heaven for everyone. <laughs> you'll have people who love you. You'll have a family. You'll have a, you'll have a family that covers the whole, the whole planet of heaven. I mean, you'll have everything. You'll have riches untold. You'll have mansion, a mansion. I mean, there'll be no end to everything that you're going to have in eternity. So whatever we give up here is just a joke. Um, Luke 9, 23, and he said unto all, if anyone doth will to come out, if anyone wants to come after me, let him disown himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And that's for me too. I mean, you know, I, sometimes I think a lot about food. Sometimes I think a lot about um, entertainment. And Jesus wants me to take up my cross and follow him. So I can use that as a testimony to others. And I can tell others how I've been blessed, little things that I've given up, how it's really helped me to grow, and how I have so much more to look forward to in heaven. Um, so anyway, that, that can help a worldly person. So I hope this video blessed you. I know it was long, but I hope you got a lot of blessing out of it. And God bless you, and may you be a great evangelist for the Lord.